All right. Well, let's um, get into the study this morning on 1 Corinthians uh, 15. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, a little bit more about the nature of the resurrection and what the Corinthians were actually uh, denying. Uh, we'll try to make as best as we can a distinction between the um, concept of the physical body resurrection and what we believe that the Bible was actually teaching uh, in terms of this subject. Now, we've pointed out to you in the past uh, broadcast that the scriptures uh, start off with Jesus dying for our sins and being raised for our justification. Uh, we can see that very clearly when we compare chapter 15 with Romans chapter 5. Uh, actually, Romans 4, 24, um, and verse 25, as well as throughout uh, Romans chapter 5. And there are some correlations to be made between Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. Um, but from that uh, perspective, we've shown that 1 Corinthians 15, uh, particularly verses 3 and 4, have their origin in Hosea chapter 5. The latter verses of chapter 5, maybe starting around verse 13, and uh, going through chapter 6 and verse 3. And we do encourage you to make note of those and study them very, very carefully because when Paul says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, he's referring to an Old Testament passage. And this is why we attempted to lay some of the foundation early on where we pointed out that Paul's gospel uh, was none other than those things that were written in the uh, law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. And he said he taught no other things than those which Moses and the prophets said were about to come. And that being the case, uh, that's where we find our foundation. So uh, we are not of those who believe that the Old Testament was jettisoned uh, at the cross or any time uh, prior to. And therefore, uh, you take up a new set of prophecies moving forward in the New Testament. That is not uh, the concept that we have. We uh, hold to the point that uh, the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD, and that's Luke 21, 20 through 22, as well as Matthew 5, 17 and 18, and uh, Hebrews 8, 13, and uh, various other scriptures uh, that uh, will support that uh, particular point. Good morning to you, uh, Ron and Paul. Now, uh, from that perspective, uh, we have Paul focusing on Christ dying for sins, and of course, Romans 4 uh, says that he was raised for our justification. Then, uh, at the end of the chapter, we've pointed out, once again, the emphasis on the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there again is the same uh, point that is made in the first part of the chapter. Uh, there is the uh, death of Christ for sin and, uh, of course, the strength of sin being the law, but nevertheless, uh, he says Christ gives us the the victory. And so once again, victory over sin and death uh, would be uh, the justification that is brought through Christ. And so that forms the inclusio or the uh, parentheses in terms of what's being talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. And all of the arguments that are made in the chapter support uh, that concept. Uh, the idea that Paul is dealing with uh, bodies coming out of the ground is foreign to his line of reasoning. And we're uh, trying to demonstrate that, and hopefully uh, we'll get that point across to you as best as we possibly can. And uh, if that's new to you, then maybe you'll go back and consider it based on some of the things that we say. Uh, in addition to that, we pointed out the continuity and the collaboration of thought between Paul's message and that of the other apostles, because one of the reasons that he mentions uh, the appearances of Christ, and not only the appearances, but also the message uh, that the other apostles taught, as he says, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached, and so you have believed, then he's pointing out the fact that the message that he taught and that which the other apostles taught was the very same message. And if that is the case, then that should encourage us and behoove us to go and look to see what did the other apostles, the other apostles teach on the subject of resurrection. Uh, 
And if we can find that out, then that will help us to understand what Paul taught about the subject. Uh, because they taught about the same things. And uh, even Peter said that in Second Peter chapter 3, where he said, Our beloved uh, brother Paul also wrote about these things, some of which were hard to, to understand. And so he was teaching things related to the end time. He was talking about eschatological matters. And he said that Paul wrote the very same thing. So there is Peter saying that their messages were the same. And here is Paul saying that the messages were the same. And so we should find no uh, distinction between what the Apostle Paul was teaching on resurrection and what the others were teaching as well. So from that perspective, then, uh, we go to Acts 3, uh, 25 and 26, just to uh, reiterate this particular point as we're uh, beginning to build uh, on the topic. And we see that Peter begins uh, his discussion on the um, resurrection uh, by talking about the coming of the Lord uh, in the earlier uh, verses of Acts chapter 3. And, uh, well, I would say not so much the earlier verses, I would say the latter verses, but uh, in around verse 21, uh, where he speaks about it, verses 20 and 21, but he talks about uh, Jesus Christ and uh, and his return. And so uh, very um, significantly, uh, making a, a focus on uh, the return of Christ. And so he says in verse 19, by the way, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the age began. Uh, we have the word world in the New King, King James Version, probably the same thing in the King James Version. But the concept here, uh, the actual word in the text is the word age, eon. And so he's saying all of these things since the age began. And then he starts with Moses, of course, just as Paul said, uh, where Paul said, you know, that he's taught no other things than those which Moses and the prophet said were about to come. Uh, here is Peter beginning with Moses as well, as he talks about and leads us into his uh, brief but very significant conversation on resurrection. Because he says, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him shall you hear in all things, whatever he says to you, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. So when Peter says these days, that shows that these things were um, current in his day and time. They were the present uh, outworking of the events and the fulfillment of the words of the prophets. And that's why Paul says they were the things that were about to come. And so he uh, begins to conclude uh, by saying, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So from that perspective, he's citing Genesis 12 and verse 3. And he's telling us that this was the promise that God made to Abraham. Uh, but the essence of that prof uh, prophecy, the essence of the promise that God made to Abraham was resurrection out of the dead. Resurrection out of the dead. And so he says, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So there's the essence of what the promise of Abraham was all about. And as we continue through chapter four, uh, ignoring the chapter division, because again, these were done uh, by man, and sometimes they didn't always uh, divide them at uh, the correct place. And I think this is one where uh, they could have uh, left it as it was and went on through a couple of more verses. But he says, now as they spoke, so it's a continuation of the same conversation. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the um, temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection out of the dead ones, the resurrection out of the dead ones. So that's a very critical point 
when we look at what the text is saying, it was a resurrection out of the dead ones. And so he was not speaking about uh, a resurrection out of the tombs, uh, but he makes it very specific and very clear that it was the resurrection out of the dead ones. And we need to identify them as we move forward, uh, as we go on uh, in the text. But in the um, third chapter of Galatians, just to uh, reconnect some of these points, in Galatians chapter 3, the scripture says, And God, foreseeing that he would justify the nations through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now look at the correlation between 1 Corinthians 15, the first um, uh, three verses, particularly verses 3 and 4, at Romans chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, and then Acts chapter 3, verses 25 through chapter 4 and verse 2. And you will see a correlation of the uh, death of Christ for the um, for offenses, for their sins, and a resurrection for their justification. That is precisely what is said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. Again, and the scripture foreseeing that God, notice, would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham uh, beforehand, saying, in you all the families or the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So from that perspective, then, if the promise of Abraham was justification in Galatians chapter 3, and if the promise of Abraham was the turning away of everyone from their iniquities in Acts chapter 3 and verse 26, then the promise of Abraham has to be the same that's mentioned in Romans 4, 25 and 26. Now, why is that important? Because in uh, Romans chapter 4, you have that very concept of God justifying Abraham. Let me read just a couple of passages from that so you can see this correlation. And this is why we were pointing out the fact that there is a relationship between Romans 5, actually, you know, parts of Romans 4 and Romans 5 uh, and 1 Corinthians 15. The scripture says, what then? This is verse 1 of Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say? that Abraham our father has found, according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified, there's your idea, there's the concept, there's the word. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You see, that promise was all about justification. And what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's what justification is. It's the uh, imputing of righteousness to Abraham. And notice, verse 4, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So what we have when we talk about justification is the turning away of one from their iniquities, but that is what results in life. Then to show you that that is the case and that it's dealing with the removal of sin, he mentions David. And he says, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. That means that this righteousness did not come through the law, but it came through grace. But notice, he says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So the blessings of Abraham, which he even points out were those that were to be given to those under the law, was all about impu imputing righteousness to them. Now that's the context of Romans 4, and that's what the context of Romans 4 ends with. It ends with Jesus Christ dying for our offenses. That's what the verse says. He says in verse 25, he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. Well, for the imputing of righteousness. Now, this is where Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 follow a very, very similar pattern. Let's notice uh, something in these verses as we are 
uh, making these, these uh, connections. When Romans 5 opens up, it opens in the same manner that 1 Corinthians 15 does, and it ends in the same manner that 1 Corinthians 15 does. Notice that he says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, when you read 1 Corinthians 15, once again, just listen to the um, continuity between those thoughts. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you, uh, which also you have received, and in which you stand. Do you see a correlation between Romans five when he talks about they were had access by faith into the grace in which they stand, and so he says, by which also you are saved. Well, that's the same concept of justification. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you unless you have believed in vain. And of course, he picks up on the fact that Christ died for their sins. So that's the same idea that we have in Romans 4, verse 26, as well as uh, verses 5, 1 and 2. And of course, that could be extended more because, you know, he talks about uh, the hope. And of course, hope is nothing other than resurrection from the dead. It is the uh, consummation of that which, which had begun and uh, which we've talked about before, and we'll say more about that um, in uh, other uh, studies. Now, we've seen how Romans 5 opens with their standing in the grace, having access through the uh, access by faith, okay? And that's the same faith that God preached to Abraham, which was about turning them away from their iniquities, imputing righteousness to them. But notice how Romans chapter 5 ends, if we're going to look at it from these divisions that are made uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> the chapter divisions and the verses. But when we notice in verse 19 through 21, the text says, For by, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. All right, so there's your context for sinners and uh, those who are made righteous. But notice uh, the emphasis that he places on the law being the strength of sin that had entered the world. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's the concept that you have in 1 Corinthians 15 in the latter verses of the chapter. They're saying, uh, in essence, the same thing. Uh, verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. So there's the offense, and the strength of sin is the law. When you compare the two, they're exactly the same. Well, why is that important? It's important because... When we look in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 is very clearly uh, the dichotomy between Christ or between Adam and Christ, between uh, sin and death, between uh, righteousness and unrighteousness, uh, all through those chapters. And that's what was introduced by Adam in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, as he says, therefore, just as through one man sin into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was about to come. So here is uh, that language of this uh, eminence that is expressed here. But then when you read, and I won't take the time to do this, I covered some of this on last week, but if you take your time and go through verses 15 through 18, uh, and even 19 if you want, you will see that the contrast, as we pointed out, was the offense versus the grace that brought life. It was the free gift that resulted in life uh, compared to the condemnation that they received as a result of the sin that entered. And so in verse 17, for if by one man's offense, 
death reign. And that's what he means when he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Death reigned through sin. That's the idea. He's not talking about physical death in Romans chapter 5. He's talking about the death that reigned through sin. And so he says, uh, if by one man's offense, death reign through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Well, that is resurrection. That's the opposite of the death. That's the opposite of condemnation. And that is the opposite of the offense. So that's why, for example, when you read in Galatians chapter 3, and the verse is 21, the Bible says, For if there had been a law which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Do you see where the text uses the term life and righteousness to describe the promise that God made to Abraham? Let me, uh, let me connect that to the promise in Galatians just so that, so that we see. Now, the whole uh, essence of what Galatians 3 is all about, when you get into the heart of it, it's about the promise of Abraham. And it, the promise is mentioned several times over and over again in Galatians 3. Uh, starting at verse 16, just um, as a place to start, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. Now watch verse 18. For if the inheritance is of the law, same concepts that he brings up in Romans 4. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. And so that's what leads into verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not for if there had been a law which could have given what? Which could have given life. What kind of life? Life from the dead. Life wherein God imputes righteousness and does not uh, account men's sins against them. And thus he says, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And you will see that emphasis of righteousness in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, that hopefully connects the teaching of Paul and Peter uh, as it relates to sin, but that also shows the correlation between uh, Romans 4 and 5 with 1 Corinthians 15 as well. Now, uh, as we uh, move into the chapter, we want to look at uh, these verses a little bit more uh, closely in terms of uh, what is being said here because the crux of the arguments begin in verse uh, 12, as we mentioned before, when he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised out of the dead ones, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, we need to um, talk about this just a little bit. Let me read the text also from the new, uh, from the concordant New Testament, which uh, does its best to try to render the Greek as um, as closely as they can in the English. And um, they don't always get every text uh, correct, but they try to do a very good job in that. This text says, "Now, if Christ is being heralded that he has been roused from among the dead, how are some among you?" saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. And, um, and this is very, very important because it is where uh, Paul starts his argument. But there are some objectionable consequences that are mentioned in the following verses that the Corinthians could not accept. And Paul makes these arguments in order to demonstrate the inconsistency of the belief of the Corinthians related to the subject of resurrection. And when we study them carefully, it should lead us, or they should lead us to the uh, conclusion that he could not possibly be talking about bodies coming out of the ground. They just will not fit uh, that particular uh, concept. And so uh, let me 
pause and say good morning once again to some of those who are here uh, on Facebook. Good morning, Paul and Beatrice and Carol and Chris and Ron, if I haven't spoken to you. Uh, but uh, good morning to all of you. And it's always a pleasure to uh, study with you. Um, and Beatrice says, so good to find you on the correct date. Now, all right. Well, hopefully uh, we're uh, taking care of that. I do have someone helping out a little bit with that, um, Alan Morton, and he's doing um, a great job. And I appreciate uh, him trying to help me organize some of those things um, related to the uh, to the broadcast. But um, some comments from Gordon Fee in the New International Commentary uh, of the New Testament regarding uh, Paul's line of reasoning, regarding his arguments. Uh, the scripture says, having reasserted, I'm sorry, this, this is not a scripture. This is a quote from his book. Uh, you get in the habit of saying things. But um, having reasserted the resurrection of Christ as the common ground of all Christian preaching and faith. And by the way, let me um, introduce this by saying uh, he is not a preterist. And um, so he does not hold to the views that we hold. But that doesn't mean that. Uh, these men cannot see some of the same points or see things from a similar point of view. And that's all that we're saying. We just want to read these comments uh, just to kind of give you an idea of a general um, uh, thrust of what the text is, is, is saying. So uh, once again, I begin and quote, having reasserted the resurrection of Christ as the common ground of all Christian preaching and faith, Paul now moves from that base to refute those who deny the resurrection of believers who have died. The argument proceeds along two lines, an appeal to logic, and those are the verses, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 28, and an appeal ad hominem, 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 34. In each case, Paul indicates the logical consequences and therefore illogical nature of their position. On the one hand, he argues at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, if they are right that there is no resurrection of the dead, that can only mean that Christ was not raised, which not only contradicts the common faith just appealed to in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. So he even understands the connection between uh, what Paul was saying earlier and how it testifies to the fact of the resurrection and sets the foundation for the arguments that follow. That's what I'm wanting you to see in this quote. And so I'll continue. Uh, let me start that sentence again, since I interrupted it with my commentary. And so he says, on the one hand, he argues at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, if they are right, that there is no resurrection of the dead, there can only mean, or that can only mean, that Christ was not raised, which not only contradicts the common faith just appealed to, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, but logically means that he and they ceased to exist as believers altogether. I think that is an absolute uh, profound statement. I think it's a very accurate statement. I think it shows that he sees, uh, at least in part, uh, the problem that the belief that is expressed of the Corinthians in the first part of the chapter uh, just does not jibe with what he says in uh, the following verses, the verses that precede verses 1 through 11. He says, on the other hand, as he continues in the next step in the argument, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28, since Christ was raised from the dead, that means that God has set in motion two irreversibles, the resurrection of all who are in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. And by that, he's alluding to the first fruits concept and thus the final destruction of death itself, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. Likewise, Paul goes on at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 34. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then both they and he are playing the role of fools. Significantly and somewhat characteristically of this letter, he concludes the present argument with a strong appeal to them to stop their sinning as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 through 34. And that is found in the New International Commentary by Gordon Fee on 1 Corinthians, pages 737 and 38. Now, let me go back to 
a point that he makes uh, in this second part, a statement that he makes when he says, uh, on the other hand, as he continues in the next step in the argument, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28, since Christ was raised from the dead, that means that God, now watch this statement, that God has set in motion two irreversibles, the resurrection of all who are in Christ. Now, you got to unpack that statement in your thinking just a bit. Because if he says that God has set in motion two irreversibles, that means that with the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection is already underway and cannot be reversed. Now, how those who hold a physical view of the resurrection can reconcile, reconcile themselves with that thought, with that idea, is amazing to me because it is the concept of the first fruits, which we uh, we'll talk about, but just like James D.G. Dunn said in uh, one of his commentaries, that when the first fruits are taken, that is an indication of two things. Number one, that the resurrection is imminent. That means it was near to take place. It wasn't something to be stretched out over generations and thousands of years. Anyone who would believe that do not, does not understand the idea of the first fruits. The first fruits means the harvest is already underway. And if you study John chapter 4, uh, Jesus said that. Let me go over and read that text for just a moment. In John chapter 4, around verse 35, the Bible says, and this is the Lord speaking, he says, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. You see, they knew from the spring festivals, from the time of Passover and the first fruits, that the harvest had begun. That was the beginning of the barley harvest. And then 50 days later, you had the day of Pentecost which was the time of the wheat harvest. And those things went together. But that was also the pledge and the indication that the harvest season was underway so that the end of that growing season would result in the general harvest, which was about four months away. Not 4,000 years, not 2,000 years, but about four months away from the perspective of, uh, you know, natural agriculture and, and their uh, crops that they were growing. But Jesus uses this illustration to talk about the true harvest, the real harvest, the harvest of souls of men out of the dead. And so this is what he says. He says, do, not, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? So he's I just want you to see this contrast that he's making in these verses. And for a long time, I read over them, did not see the significance and the power of it. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Now, if you don't think that's imminent in terms of four months, well, that's that's pretty imminent. And that's, that's where D. G., uh, James D.G. Dunn draws his concept of an imminent harvest based on the word first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15. But he says, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white unto harvest. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about the wheat in the field or the maize or whatever else they grew. He wasn't talking about that. He was trying to get them to focus on the eschatological harvest, on the time of the end, to know that the reason he had come to the earth was to die, and he would die at one of the feast days at the Passover, and then following that would be the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then immediately following that would be the first fruits. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. And so this is why he tells them, 
Look at the fields, for they are already white unto the harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for what? For eternal life. Do you think they were growing eternal life in the field? Do you think they had sown physical seeds of eternal life in the field? I doubt it very seriously. That's not what they were about to harvest. It says, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying, or for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. You see, do you get that? What he's saying is that it was the prophets who, through their prophetic word, were sowing for these times. But in the time of the apostles, it was their time to reap the harvest. So they had been laboring toward this end, preparing everything for this time of the end. But when the apostles come, they're here to reap. That indicates the uh, eminence, the nearness of that harvest of eternal life, which is nothing but resurrection. That's what it is. Let me check these comments out from uh, Brother Stephen here. It says, when I went back and saw that Isaiah 28 and Hosea 13 were clearly speaking of spiritual death, that was an eye opener to me. Uh, absolutely, Stephen. And it should be an eye-opener to everyone. I had the privilege of um, sharing a meal and um, company and conversations and fellowship with uh, a gentleman who came down to see me um, from, I guess he came up from Atlanta uh, to see me. And so we sat down and talked about these things. And he talked about his journey into uh, discovery. And of course, he had listened to the Holger. If you listen, I'm sure listening, this would be um, something that would be encouraging to you since you too are a product of a debate. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, he had listened to the debate with Brother Holger Neubauer and uh, Bruce Reeves. And as he was listening to that debate, he heard Holger make a statement that he was never again going to preach anyone out of Hades. And he says that caused him to really go back and study. And of course, during that debate, I was uh, having sort of a written debate with guys in the margins or in, in the comment section. And he said, and, and he was also reading those comments. And of course, those things led him to uh, the full understanding that uh, Christ had come, that these uh, matters were fulfilled. And he already had a good background that he'd studied before. So Stephen, we understand uh, very well uh, about what you are saying when, when you go back and you look at these very things and you can see the idea. So back to what we were saying, that is uh, James D.G. Dunn. That was number one point that he said. He said that the um, first fruits indicated that the harvest had already begun. And so that's what Fee is saying when he says that this sets in motion two irreversible uh, concepts or two irreversibles, as he said it. And so one was that the resurrection of all who are in Christ and thus the final destruction of death was already underway. It set it in motion. It was already underway. And that's what Jesus said as well in John chapter 4, um, verses 35 through uh, 38. Verse 35. But the second point that Don makes uh, and that's James D.G. Dunn. The second point that he makes was that it also meant that the resurrection was imminent. The very points that we're saying here. And so those words are very, very important. The resurrection was already underway, that it was imminent. And so we cannot, if we're going to study that term, uh, we cannot ignore that. And we have these men. Now, uh, who even support the idea, even though they themselves uh, don't uh, at this point understand uh, 
that these matters have been fulfilled. Yet uh, the conclusions that they draw in some of their writings would logically lead them to that point if they were to, uh, to see them and to acknowledge that. So what the text is saying is, uh, and this is what Fee has just said, if they rejected the resurrection of the dead ones, and let me uh, see if I can identify these dead ones, at least from uh, one point of view. And I remember when I was having the debate back in 1994, I think it was, with uh, Stephen Wiggins, who is, um, uh, good morning, uh, Nasakura. Uh, when I was having the debate with uh, Stephen Wiggins right here in Memphis, Tennessee, a debate, by the way, that the Memphis School of Preaching boycotted and threatened their students and told them not to attend. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was having the debate with him, and I pointed this out because he was trying to lump the dead ones with everyone as if it was just a general concept of, you know, all the dead um, from that time up until now or up until the time we had the debate at that particular time. But that's what he means. And and uh, so it's all of the dead. And that's what people mean today when they look at the passage. They think that it's everyone who has ever died and will die in the future until this alleged future return of Christ. But that is a woefully uh, gross misreading of the text and understanding of what this passage is saying. You see, the Bible says Christ rose out of the dead ones. And if we have to look at that, we have to look at that from a historical point of view. We have to look at that from a particular timeline to identify who they were. Well, Jesus did not die. And, and Paul makes these distinctions in these arguments that we find in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus did not die under the new covenant. He did not die after the church had begun. And see, that's why in verses 1 through 11, we have this separation between those who were standing where? In the gospel, New Testament believers. And those to whom he had appeared where some 500, this was after his resurrection, he appeared to this above 500 brethren at once, some of whom remained until the present, at the time of, of Paul's writing. He makes the distinction between them and crafts these arguments based on who they are compared to who the dead ones are. Here's the point. The Corinthians were not denying their own resurrection. That's why Fee raised that point. Let me read it to you again. If they are right that there is no resurrection of the dead, that can only mean that Christ was not raised, which not only contradicts the common faith just appealed to. In other words, he's saying, the Corinthians wouldn't be raised. So we have to understand these uh, contradictions that are evident from the beliefs that they held. But the point is this, and see, the reason he mentions Christ is because of the solidarity, because of the fact that Christ was a part of this group called the dead ones. Now, once again, and you know, if I don't get any other point across to you this morning, this one is very, very key to understand it in the timeline of resurrection. And there was a timeline. If you're going to talk about first fruits uh, at the barley harvest and then first fruits at the wheat harvest, that's a timeline, ladies and gentlemen. And if you're going to talk about four months later, you know, even if you're talking about natural agriculture, that was a timeline or the time of the harvest, because the time of the harvest comes at the fall festivals the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Trumpets was the judgment feast. But nevertheless, as we are saying, Christ 
did not die under the new covenant. He was not raised out of new covenant saints. Very, very important. Even the writer in Hebrews makes a distinction because he says in after he starts with Abel and goes all the way through all of those who had died by faith, Abel, Noah, Enoch, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, David, Jephthah, Moses, Gideon, all the host of these Old Testament saints. Look at what he says and how he delineates between them. He says, these all died in faith, not having received the promise. There's your word promise again, showing you once again that Paul's concept is resurrection. But we showed that the promise that Abraham looked for was the turning away and justification. It was the impart, imparting of righteousness in relation to sin. But he says, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, God having provided something better for us. Now, the they and the us are two different categories of people. The they refers to all the Old Testament saints. The us refers to the New Testament saints. The Corinthians would be in the category of the us. So would the Thessalonians, etc. And any of the rest in the New Testament. But that group out of which Christ rose was the they. Those were the Old Testament saints. So when we talk about the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, we are not talking about every one from Adam up till today and beyond. This was a very specific closed group of Old Testament saints. Because we know that after Jesus' death, we begin to mark out a new era of saints dying in Christ. And therefore, you have those in 1 Corinthians 15. And so what they're doing is they're not denying bodies coming out of the ground. They're denying that these Old Testament saints, these dead ones, would be raised. And perhaps we might talk a little bit about why they were denying it, because they had a reason. And secondly, it was not the entire church that was denying this. It was only some among the Corinthians who were denying it. But now you should be able to see at least the contradiction between claiming, number one, that they would rise from the dead because that had to be the end of their faith. Paul said their faith would not be in vain as long as they stood in the gospel. And that also would mean that those who were above 500 brethren at once, and there's a reason why he connects them in this argument, they believed in their resurrection. But if they believed in Jesus' resurrection from the dead or from uh, out of the dead ones, excuse me, then how could they say there is no resurrection of the dead ones? In other words, here's the point. Jesus is one of the dead ones. He's the first one. He's the first fruit of them. So how can you deny that he has risen out of them and then at the same time, in the same breath, say they would not rise. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time that we have for today. It has been a pleasure being with you. We're going to continue this on next week, and we look forward to being with you at that time. May God bless you. Visit us at the Rains Road Church of Christ at 33 East Rains Road in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm William Bell, and you have a very pleasant good morning. <laughs>